everybody again. Uh, Robert Gostecker is our LTEC lecturer. Today's topic is going to be on uh, electrolysis and generation of hydrogen. And uh, I introduced him yesterday. Uh, he's come to us from a distinguished career, uh, uh, starting his uh, graduate work at Berkeley and moved on to uh, do some postdoc work at Berkeley and also at the University of Baum, continued on. General Motors, where he had a very impactful career in, in the fuel cell area. And then from there, uh, he uh, a little bit of sabbatical here and there, and he ended up at the uh, Technical University of Munich. He's been there for the last maybe 10 years or so. Longer. Longer. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, 14 years maybe. <laughs> and uh, so he's going to talk to us today about uh, electrolysis. But I also want to introduce. Uh, Jessica Sarin over here. She came to, she's visiting today from the University of Sherbrooke up in Canada. And uh, she will be joining Hoover at uh, 1230 or so for the lunch with the students uh, to talk about various aspects of their career and uh, any type of uh, discussion you'd like to have with, with our visitors. Okay. Uh, if you really want to kick off the conversation, you can talk about what blockchain. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I've been for an hour and a half. <laughs> but anyway, uh, who are or yours? <laughs> okay, well, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so today it'll be about anodes and cathodes again, but uh, this time in fuel cells. Uh, sorry, in electrolyzers. Um, and so what I want to talk about is a, is a project we did uh, over the course of maybe five six years, which had to do with uh, pan water electrolysis. And so we started the project in pan water electrolysis. And the first question was like, well, what are the losses in a water electrolyzer and how much catalyst do you really need? And do you have enough catalyst actually to use water electrolysis by pan uh, water electrolyzers on a global scale, right? Do you have enough uh, noble metals even available? And uh, so what I talk about is a little background on uh, pan water electrolysis, uh, then talk about, well, what's the activity of the catalyst and what is sort of the target of the amount of catalyst we want to apply to a membrane electrode assembly, so the loading. Uh, then uh, talk about the development of a uh, new catalyst. This was done actually in collaboration with Herreros, a noble metal company, uh, trying to reduce the required amount of iridium on a pen electrolyzer. And then uh, this last part I'll probably skip, uh, but uh, we'll see. So this is a microporous layer, which is a porous transport layer for the water electrolyzer. Okay, so water electrolysis is actually quite old. Uh, so these are this is a picture of the alkaline, so liquid alkaline uh, water electrolyzer at the Aswan Dam in Egypt uh, installed in 1960. And that time, this was 200 megawatts. So nowadays, you know, in Germany, we have this target of installing one or two gigawatts by the by 2030. Actually, 60 years ago, this was already done on the almost gigawatt scale, right? So not so bad. Uh, so this that time this was uh, uh, 0.7 megawatt electrolyzers uh, and uh, made about 30,000 pounds of hydrogen a year. And so uh, a more recent technology, of course, is the PEM water electrolysis. So this is based on a proton exchange membrane. So these are the same membranes which you would have in a, a PEM fuel cell. And so here is a picture from uh, the energy park uh, in, in a city in Germany where they install Siemens water electrolyzers of about two megawatts each. Uh, and uh, what's the differences of these technologies? Well, alkaline has the advantage it doesn't need any noble metals, um, but at the same time, the, the hydrogen you can produce is usually low pressure hydrogen, or you have to have balanced pressure, which is more complex. Um, the disadvantage, of course, of the pen water electrolysis, you need the noble metals, you need the iridium and platinum for the electrodes, but you can make high pressure hydrogen. And one big advantage is that the power density is three to seven times higher than compared to an alkaline technology. Uh, so the footprint really of the plant is about an order of magnitude higher than the alkaline. Uh, in terms of durability, both have proven durability, so 50,000 to 100,000 hours. Of course, it becomes difficult uh, to measure the durability above 100,000 hours. There's not so many systems in the field, uh, but this is uh, definitely uh, achievable. And so what, how does it look like? Uh, the pen water electrolyzer stack is set up more or less like a fuel cell, as I said. Uh, except that the reactions are reversed. So instead of oxygen, oxygen reduction, you have the oxygen evolution. 
Uh, so you take water and you make oxygen. The protons are conducted through the proton conducting membrane. So it's a ionomeric membrane, a cation exchange membrane. As it goes over the other side, it drags along and loses the water. And then on the other side, the protons are recombined, reduced uh, to make hydrogen. And the length scale here is that the electrodes are very thin, 10 microns or even thinner. Uh, membranes are in the order between 50 to 200 microns. Um, so the current technology is maybe closer to 200, so 50 is sort of where one will want to end up with. And then you have uh, porous transport materials through which you transport the hydrogen uh, and on this side, the oxygen and the water. Right? And uh, then you have flow fields, which are essentially just channels in a flow field plate where you transport the water and the, and the gases. Right? And so in order to have a homogeneous access from the flow field channel to the electrode, we have to have this porous media between. So if we look at uh, what's in there, we have uh, on the hydrogen side, a platinum, a carbon supported platinum catalyst. So for the hydrogen evolution, so this again is the same catalyst as uh, is used in fuel cells. So you have nanoparticles of platinum on a carbon support. Uh, the carbon support gives you the surface area to deposit all of these nanoparticles. Uh, and then the diffusion medium on this side is a carbon fiber paper, right? So this is a typical uh, non-woven. This is a paper, and then you have also non-woven felt material. Now, on the other side, of course, we have very high potentials. Uh, so you cannot use carbon. And so what is used here are porous titanium layers. So in the electrolysis uh, literature, they're usually referred to as PTLs or porous transport layers. And uh, so they either are sintered titanium particles uh, or they are felt materials, which are sort of uh, either woven or interwoven materials. Uh, the uh, catalyst for the oxygen evolution, the only really stable catalyst in a 10 watt electrolyzer is iridium. And you can find, of course, literature for uh, ruthenium catalysts, um, but usually their durability at, let's say, 60 to 80 degrees Celsius is on the order of a few hundred hours, right? And then it sort of disappears. Uh, so really, right now, everything is based on iridium catalysts. The nature of the catalyst is different. Sometimes it's iridium black, so a metal. Sometimes it's thermal iridium oxide. Sometimes it's some hydrous oxide, but it's usually always iridium. Now, while on this side, I can support my nanoparticles of platinum on the carbon in order to dilute the amount of platinum in the volume of the electrode. On this side, I cannot do this because there is no stable support. Right? And so usually the density of metal is much higher uh, on the oxygen evolution side than it is on the platinum, uh, on the hydrogen evolution side. So if we look about what's the uh, benefits and the challenges of pen water electrolysis, the big benefit is, of course, you can go to high current density. And so here, is a polarization curve shown for uh, water electrolysis, a zero hydrogen, uh, it's a single cell, and it's an HN117 membrane. So this is a close to 200 microns thick, right? And so thermodynamically, the reversing potential is at about 1.28 volts. And practically, the first currents you can see at about 1.45 volts, right? The reason is that you have a very large over potential for the oxygen evolution. So this is a kinetic over potential. And then you have a sort of almost linear region, which is just the ohmic loss. And the ohmic loss is the ohmic loss through the membrane, right? You have an ohmic resistance, and uh, it follows more or less Ohm's law. And then you see here, there's very little other losses. And so the question is, well, how do I benchmark it? And typically, it's common that you benchmark it against either a certain cell voltage or, in principle, a, a efficiency, right? And so if you want to look at the efficiency, you have two options. Uh, you can use the higher heating value or the lower heating value. Right, of hydrogen. So higher heating value means you make uh, you start out from vapor or lower heating value you start out from the liquid, right? So since you start out from liquid, the common is the lower heating value, uh, so LH, LHG. And so if you say, well, you would want 70% on the lower heating value and your equilibrium, equilibrium potential is 1.28 volts, that would translate to about 1.79 volts, right? So this is what I drew in here. This would be the point at which you have 70% efficiency on the lower heating value basis, if you translate to the higher heating value basis, this is 83%. Right? And uh, practically speaking, uh, the best you could do in a thermal neutral operation of an electrolyzer would be 100% on the higher heating value. So we couldn't get so much better. right? Um, so however, how can we get better? We can get better by increasing the power density. Power density means I have to try to hike up the current density. And the simple approach is, of course, to make a thinner membrane. I have a thinner membrane, this yellow part becomes much less right? because my ohmic losses are much less. 
And what you now can see is that the 70% LHG point shifts to a higher current density and it's about a factor of two, right? So what you have there is without a penalty on your efficiency, you have doubled the current density at the same voltage, so you double the power density of your device. Right? Um, now, the other big advantage is you can have high differential pressure of hydrogen. So that means you can produce high pressure hydrogen, but ambient pressure oxygen, right? Which has advantages if you do not want to use the oxygen, right? In terms of uh, safety of the electrolyte, because high pressure oxygen is quite complicated to handle. Um, and then, however, the big problem is uh, that we use iridium on the oxygen electrode and platinum on the hydrogen electrode. And if you talk about the global scale application of water electrolysis, the question is, well, do I have enough iridium? Do I have enough platinum? And how expensive really is it? Um, and so this is the question I'm trying to answer in this talk, right? How sustainable is this technology as I require noble metals? And let's say, in view of the fact that the last 20 years, nobody has found any better catalyst than iridium. Okay, um, so if we want to look at the, this question, sort of, you know, how good is the catalyst? Can I make it better or not? Um, is the, the first question to be answered is sort of where are my voltage losses, right? And this is sort of just a zoomed in view from what was on the previous page, an analysis of the different voltage loss terms in the PEM water electrolyte, right? And so what you can see is most of it is due to the oxygen evolution kinetics. So despite the fact that we use iridium, uh, then you lose something in the membrane, so it's still 150 millivolts at 3 amps per centimeter square for this uh, 50 micron membrane. Uh, your mass transport losses, both for hydrogen transport in the, in the electrodes, because, sorry, proton transport in the electrodes, you have, still have to move the protons across these 10 micron thick electrodes, is very little, right? At uh, 3 amps per centimeter square, it's 30 millivolts. So in terms of percentage, it's like uh, maybe one and a half percent or so. And then there is another term here, which uh, when we looked at it the first time, we called it sort of a capillary resistance. And it's related to the fact that when you produce hydrogen on the hydrogen electrode, the hydrogen has to go through your porous transport layer into the gas channels and then come out. And uh, there you can actually have a capillary pressure. So the effective pressure of hydrogen at the electrode is higher than the pressure which you collect in your tank, so to speak, right? And there you have a Nernstian penalty. Right? Because uh, if you produce hydrogen at a higher pressure, you have indeed more potential. And so this is about 20 millivolts here. And so the main loss is from oxygen catalysis. And the question is actually, what's the effect of pressure? Right? And as I said, one of the big advantages of a pan water electrolyzer is that in principle, I can use the membrane as a barrier. And for this reason, I can make high pressure hydrogen and low pressure oxygen without significant intermixing. And the question is, how efficient is it to make hydrogen at different pressures? And this is shown on the next slide, where we have these polarization curves at one bar of oxygen and increasing the hydrogen pressure from one bar to 30 bar, right? And uh, what you can see is, of course, if I go from one bar to three to 10 to 30 bars, I increase the cell voltage, which I need, because that's what you would expect based on the Nernst equation, right? Uh, and uh, at the higher current densities, actually, the gain here uh, at high current density, the gain is less than it is at lower current densities, right? And if you calculate what you would expect, then you would say, well, what's the partial pressure of hydrogen at one bar? At 80 degrees, the water vapor pressure is about half a bar, so the hydrogen partial pressure is half a bar. At 30 bar, the hydrogen partial pressure is about 29 and a half bar. So it's about a factor of 60 in between. And if you put it in the Nernst equation, uh, a factor of 60 uh, at 35 millivolts per pressure decade from the Nernst equation would say it should increase by 60 millivolts, but it's only 45. And the reason why it is less is actually because of the scapular pressure. It doesn't play a role anymore when I go to very high pressure, right? And uh, so actually here you would find very close to the 60 millivolts. And so what this says is that the compression of hydrogen in a pan water electrolyzer is 100% efficient, right? So if you use, let's say, a pump, to compress hydrogen, the typical efficiency is 70%. In, a, in an electrolyzer, it really is, as far as the voltage is concerned, 100% efficient. However, if you go to too high a pressure, you will still have permeation of hydrogen through the membrane, and you will have some losses in Faraday efficiency. But uh, so in general, what people can believe nowadays is that we want to produce hydrogen somewhere between 20 and 30 bar, because that's sort of the optimum of having compressed hydrogen um, with not so much permeation losses. 
because then from, of course, 20 bars, you would still have to use compressors to go up to typically six, 700 bars or so. But then the volumetric flow rates, of course, become much smaller at the higher pressure. Um, so the next question is, well, how active are these catalysts and what is sort of the target for the amount of catalyst which we can use in a pen water electrolyzer? And the analogy can be drawn in the, in the pen fuel cell. So when uh, I was in the fuel cell program at General Motors, uh, there was the question uh, actually posed by the National Academy of Science and Engineering saying, well, is it actually possible? Do we have enough platinum in the world to build 50 million cars a year, right? And so we had to prove that time. Um, what was it? We had to establish what is the target for the amount of platinum per kilowatt of energy you produce, and can you reach it? Right. And the same question really comes here in the pen water electrolyzer. What is the target for the amount of iridium you can use, and can you reach it? Right. And so this is what I'll try to answer in this next section. Um, so first, you have to make a catalyst layer, right? And so this is an example uh, for the approach taken for the hydrogen electrode, right? So what we use is the platinum and carbon catalyst. Uh, and then we use an ionomer. So this is a proton conducting polymer, which you mix in the electrode. And then the electrode consists of three parts, the catalyst, the ionomer, and void volume, right? And so you can think of it, you take the catalyst, you put it in a layer, and in between the catalyst particles, there's void. Then you add ionomer, and the ionomer is like honey between rocks, and it goes in the voids, right? And uh, essentially what happens is as you add more and more ionomer, so this is the ionomer to catalyst ratio, a uh, carbon ratio, so in this case, the solid fraction stays the same because you put down your, your catalyst and you're just filling something in the pores. So the height of the catalyst layer doesn't change, right? But of course, the volume fraction of ionomer increases and consequently the void volume fraction decreases. And since through the void volume fraction, I have to transport water and hydrogen, of course, the mass transport resistance is increased when I have too little void volume fraction. Right? And so in principle, this cathode ionomer to carbon ratio affects mostly the high current density performance. If I do not put enough ionomer in there, I will have proton conduction resistances because I don't have a conducting phase. Um, but if I put too much, uh, I will have uh, problems at high current density, right? So the first thing to optimize the membrane electric assembly is sort of trying to understand you know, where you want to sit here. And then uh, the other thing which is interesting is you look at the permeation losses, right? So essentially, uh, hydrogen can dissolve in the membrane, essentially in the aqueous phase of the membrane, and then it can just diffuse to the other side by friction diffusion, right, by permeation. And uh, if you have a hydrogen pressure of uh, one bar, right, you can say, well, how much hydrogen permeation do I have? Right, and the permeation ratio I can choose as a molar flux in moles per centimeters for a second, or I can give it as an equivalent current density, right? And so, Let's say if we start out here, uh, the crossover current density here is very, very small. Uh, it's, it's in the order of a fraction of a million per centimeter square. So if I operate my electrolyzer at one amp per centimeter square, this is 0.1%, right? So that would be my Faraday efficiency would be 99.9. And then what one sees here is that as I increase the current density, I actually get a higher flux of hydrogen uh, across the membrane. So this is, of course, what you would not expect. Right, you would expect to shouldn't change. Uh, and then what you can see is that as you put more ionomer in the structure, meaning as you have less void volume, this raise this raising pressure is actually sorry, the raising permeation rate is actually higher. Right. And the explanation, so at one ball, right, we have a nine-fold increase here when we go to high current density here, 25 volts. And uh, at 34. Uh, we don't see so much change in, a, in terms of factor, right? Of course, we have more permeation because you have a higher pressure, so fixed loss as you have more permeation. But first of all, the effect of the void volume fraction, the ionomer to carbon ratio is not so high. And then the overall factor is only a factor of 1.1 to 1.6 instead of roughly 10 to 20 volts, right? And uh, there's two explanations to, uh, to rationalize this. Uh, our, uh, so there was one, a paper uh, by uh, Trinke et al. And so what they said is, okay, if you go to high fluxes, you get the supersaturation of hydrogen. And as you get the supersaturation, then of course you have a higher flux. Um, our explanation really is that you have a local pressure buildup because of capillary pressure. And this lower pressure, this pressure buildup affects you through the Nernst equation. But if, a pressure, if you had a pressure buildup of a few bar, 
uh, if you go from one bar to a couple of bars, the Nernst equation says you lose 20 millivolts. But if you go from 30 bars to 32 bars, it's only a few percent. And then the Nernst equation says it's almost nothing. So whatever the truth is, but the fact is you have permeation which plays a big role at the lower at the lower pressure, but doesn't really change so much with current density at the higher pressures, right? And in general, of course, you would use a lower IP2 ratio for the design of the hydrogen electrode. And so the next question is, well, how much platinum do I really need? Uh, current electrolyzer have a platinum loading of about 0.3 milligrams per centimeter square. And the question is, is that really necessary? And so here's an experiment where we looked at the, the effect of different platinum loadings on the hydrogen electrode, on the cathode. And so one is sort of the typical state of the art, 0.3 milligram per centimeter square. And then one is about uh, 25 micrograms per centimeter square. So you know, more than a factor of 10 less. So this catalyst here is 50 weight percent platinum and carbon. This is 5 weight percent platinum and carbon. So overall, actually, the thickness of the electrodes is very similar, right? Because I just put less catalyst. So I dilute, so to speak, my electrode with carbon, right? So I can keep the same volume. And uh, so the question is, well, what's the difference in performance? And so what we would expect based on the kinetics, so this is the measurement here on the kinetics of the hydrogen oxidation evolution reaction in a pen fuel cell. So it's exactly the same environment, so we expect that it applies here. And uh, so there we would say, well, for this difference in loading, we would expect about 25 millivolts difference at the uh, six amps per centimeter square, so pretty high current density. And so these are the data. Uh, this is uh, the same. Uh, the same loading on the more or less the same loading on the oxygen catalyst uh, and then this is the platinum shows a uh, factor of uh, 12 or so different and uh, when you look at the ohmically resist corrected uh, resistance so the ohm hfr free resistance uh, because there's always small differences in the contact resistances in the cell then you can see they're very very close right so you have a little bit uh, almost no difference right and so the difference is about uh, 20 millivolts or so at six amps per centimeter square, right? And so, in principle, the platinum loading doesn't really play a role in those very low loadings, and so it becomes insignificant. Um, and this, of course, what one would expect. Now, the um, oxygen electrode is a little bit more complicated, right? Um, there, we have two issues. One is we cannot really easily support our iridium on a inert support material because there is nothing electrically conductive that would be stable at these at these potentials. And the second one is actually what is our requirement, right? Uh, how do we develop our requirement? And so here is one one rational way one could choose. There's probably many different ways you could look at it, uh, but this was sort of the way we tried to rationalize it. And so this is from the International Energy Agency, the net zero emission scenario, which they published a few years ago, 2021. And they said, okay, if I want to decarbonize industry, I need to produce hydrogen. And uh, I need to produce hydrogen from renewable energy, so there would be electrons, so that would be electrolysis, right? Uh, and so what they said, what they predicted was that by the year 2050, they would need 3,600 gigawatts of electrolysis. Um, so that would be needed in 30 years. So that would mean that if we install it starting tomorrow, we would have to install about 120 gigawatts a year. Of course, it's not going to happen, but let's say if you don't start tomorrow and you only start in 10 years, then you have to install 150 gigawatts a year or something like this, right? Um, this number is actually quite wild because the worldwide electricity production last year, if I take the terawatt hours, I divide it by 10,000 hours a year, is 3,000 gigawatts, right? So essentially, this is equivalent to adding the global supply of electricity, but it would have to be renewable. Right? And so our current global supply of electricity is maybe 15 to 20 percent renewable. And now I really need to get to this number, which is all renewable, right? So this is an order of magnitude increase in renewable electricity. So this is, of course, a huge challenge. Uh, but the question is, well, how far would we get with the iridium we have available? And so for that, we would need to know, well, what do we use nowadays in an electrolyzer? And so this is uh, some data with the sort of conventionally what, what you would buy today, about two milligram iridium per centimeter square. It would be a thick membrane. And the temperature typically is about 60 degrees in order to get good durability. Um, 
So then this would be the polarization curve. It's pretty close to what I showed you before, a little bit more than one end per centimeter square. It's 70% efficiency. And if I take the iridium loading and I divide it by the power density, so the power density is the current times the voltage, then I would get about one gram of iridium per kilowatt, right? So one kilowatt of electrolyzer would require uh, uh, one gram of platinum. Um, how much iridium do we have? So the world supply of iridium is about eight tons per year. So not so much, it's a byproduct of platinum mining. Uh, if I want to install 120 gigawatts a year, and I need one gram of iridium per kilowatt, that is 120 tons of iridium a year. <laughs> not so useful, right? Because what do I do with this? Uh, that I can make PEM electrolysis, but I could never use it on a large scale. And the next thing is, okay, how much better could I get? So the simple approach is I make the membrane thinner, right? If I make the membrane thinner, my ohmic area extends and I can get higher current densities, right? So for this loading, I would get up to about four amps per centimeter squared. If I now take four amps per centimeter squared times 1.8 volts, it's the power density, and I take two milligram iridium divided by the power density, I get 0.3 gram iridium per kilowatt. So, in this case, 120 gigawatts a year would require 36 tons. Still a bit too much, right? So not possible. So of course we cannot do it. So the question is, you can ask the question the other way. What would have to be the gram iridium per kilowatt so I could do it, right? And so this is shown here. If I increase my gram iridium per kilowatt, decrease it by a factor of 20 from 0.3 to 0.015, then I would need two tons of iridium a year for the 120 gigawatts. That's my target, right? So this is really the analogy what people did with filters, right? So really, this is my requirement. If I cannot build an electrolyzer which gets close to this, there's no point. Of course, it's a bit exaggerated because probably part of this will be from alkaline electrolysis and so on. But I mean, it's a rough, a rough number, right? Um, and so two tons would be 25% of the iridium would go into pen water electrolysis, which is reasonable. Um, so what did people propose? So our number from a couple of years ago, we said we need about 0.01 instead of 0.015. And then there's another data point of the literature that came up with 0.05, all of which are, of course, much lower than what we have today. Um, and so what it means is, right, our 22 milligrams per centimeter square, we have to get down to at least 0.1 milligram per centimeter square. That would be the requirement. Um, so now this is an experiment where we use the catalyst, which is available commercially. And so this is a film of iridium oxide coated on titanium oxide. And so this is like a high surface area of titanium oxide, which is non-conductive, which is coated with a thick enough film of iridium oxide to become conductive on the surface and to have activity uh, for the oxygen. And so this contains about 75 weight percent of iridium. And so what we did is we uh, so this is typical state of the art, two milligram per centimeter square. We increased and decreased the loading, and uh, we measured the IR free, so the ohmically corrected cell voltage as a function of the logarithm of the loading. And what you expect for this type of catalyst oxygen evolution, it follows the tau kinetics. So one decade of decrease in loading should have an increase in the performance of one tau slope. And the tougher slope is about 50 millivolts, so this would be the dashed lines, right? So what you expect is as you reduce the amount of iridium, you should follow the, the dashed line here. But in reality, what you see is in the beginning you do, but at the end you deviate at low current densities quite a bit, 50 millivolts. At high current densities, uh, it becomes very bad. And the reason is that as I reduce the catalyst loading, my electrode gets thinner. And once I have an electrode with the thickness of uh, the lower micron, with catalyst particles, which are in the order of 100 nanometers, I cannot make a homogeneous electrode anymore, and I cannot properly contact it anymore, right? So this, this is sort of the issue, uh, because we would expect it to go along this line. And so the reason, when we look at these electrodes, uh, here you see the porous transport layer, so this is the microporous um, or macroporous uh, titanium. This is the membrane, and this is your iridium catalyst layer. So this is this roughly one micron thick layer. And you can imagine that where it is contacted by the porous transport layer, it is active. But in these regions, to be active, it would require that you have in-plane conduction of electrons. But in-plane conduction of electrons requires a perfect layer that doesn't have any cracks, and having a layer without cracks at one micron 
uh, turned out to not be possible. So the question is, well, how can we make electrodes for such low loadings? And so there's several pathways. One is to develop a catalyst which has a low iridium packing density, meaning if I make an electrode of a certain thickness, that I have very little iridium in there. But that requires a support material on which I can put my nanoparticles, but that doesn't exist. Um, and then you can make an estimate, okay, how much would you lose if I reduce the loading by a factor of 10? Well, I would lose about 50 millivolts. That would be my total stop if I could make such a catalyst. And then the other one is if I can make a microporous layer so that the content is everywhere along here and not just every 20, 30 microliters, then you might also get the benefit. Right. However, there is no microporous layer so far. In recent years, people have started to develop it uh, because, of course, the only material which is stable is titanium. And uh, if you just put titanium powder, you have too many contact resistances, so it must be fused in place. Right. So it's a bit more complex. So let's start with the first one. And uh, that started out in the deep garden in 2018 uh, with a guy from Heraos. And uh, we were together in this project and we said, okay, how can we make such a catalyst? Right. And uh, it really truly was on a napkin, but we didn't trace it. Uh, that's a pity. But anyway, so that time we said, well, you know, how could we make such a catalyst? You know, and um, our concept is shown here. So this was in this so called Power to X uh, program. So we called it the Power to X catalyst, which meanwhile has been scaled up by Hereo. So you can buy it now. Uh, to use batteries of 10 kilos, uh, which is many gigawatts. Uh, so this. And so the concept was this, right? So how do I make a catalyst for low NR loading? So this was a Yumiko catalyst. It had a titanium oxide skeleton, particle size about 50 nanometers, each of these spheres, which was coated with about six nanometer iridium oxide film. So the iridium oxide gives you electrical conductivity, and of course it gives you the activity. And so what we said is, well, what if I get the titanium support, which has a 10 times lower BET surface area? So the particles are 10 times bigger. I still coat them with the same layer thickness. I have much less iridium per volume, right? Here is much more red area in this square than in this square. And this would be our concept for a low packing density iridium catalyst, right? And so we were working with, it wasn't you know, as simple as on the napkin, but uh, there were many, many little problems, but uh, in principle, at the end, and I'll show you, it worked out. But uh, so the question is, well, do you get such a support material that can be found? Uh, and uh, so this allows you to get lower iridium loadings for the same electrode thickness. And so the other approach you can do is, I mean, all the iridium which is used in the second, third, fourth, fifth, and tenth smaller layer is wasted, right? You only utilize iridium on the top. So of course, you could say, well, how thin can I make this film so that it is still sufficiently conductive? Right? And so here we, uh, Hereos actually made different uh, materials, right? Because it's different amounts. Uh, and then we tested it. Um, and so this was analyzing by XBS. And so what we see here is uh, the titanium signal. And this is the iridium signal. So this was the commercial catalyst. And uh, as you make the, thin, the film thinner, you see, sorry, this was a commercial commercial catalyst, right? So the film, the iridium film is very thick. So you see a lot of iridium signal, almost no titanium. And then this was the catalyst uh, finally used the iridium signal compared to the titanium signal now is almost 21, right? So you can do a proper analysis, the mass balance. And it's about two and a half uh, nanometers uh, of a film thickness, which is possible, right? So finally, the catalyst which was produced, this was sort of this benchmark from Umicore, right? 75 weight iridium. And the, this is the packing density, two gram uh, iridium per centimeter cube of electrode. Uh, the density of iridium is, of course, 20 gram per centimeter cube, right? So it's a bit diluted. Uh, however, a platinum catalyst, uh, what I showed you before, that would be about 0.01 grams uh, platinum per centimeter square, 0.1 grams platinum per centimeter square, so about 1% or so. Um, and then this is a new catalyst. And so this had a packing density about the factor of five different, right? So it says we could make a five times lower iridium loading for the same electrode thickness, right? And this is sort of what we wanted. However, this catalyst was a thermal iridium oxide. This was a hydrous iridium oxide, the way it was deposited, right? So this was a, a different. And so the next issue was well, this hydrous iridium oxide was actually not very conductive, right? It didn't conduct electrons very well. And so 
Here is the powder conductivity. This is the thermal iridium oxide. This is the new catalyst from Herreus, which is uh, the hydrous iridium oxide, and the conductivity is more than two orders of magnitude lower, right? And so it was not very good. So we did a study uh, of uh, heat treatment of the material where you heat treated at higher temperatures to essentially call sign the hydrous iridium oxide into iridium oxide. And what you can see is the conductivity then jumps up uh, to values which were sufficient. And if you go to too high a temperature, then the conductivity goes down again, right? And so during the heat treatment, what happens, uh, this is the cyclic volcanogram of a hydrous iridium oxide, typical feature. Uh, this was a Yumiko catalyst, which was a thermal iridium oxide. And this was the Herreus catalyst after calcination of, in this case, 375 degrees Celsius, right? And so essentially you're converting the hydrous iridium oxide into an iridium oxide, right? And the question is, why does the conductivity drop? And uh, essentially what you see is in the beginning, you have a layer of a hydrous iridium oxide. When you heat it, uh, it slowly starts to convert. Uh, you get iridium oxide, and if you heat it too much, it sort of agglomerates, and then you have naked titanium oxide and big boulders of iridium oxide, and then of course there's no surface conductivity anymore, right? So it was important to sort of find that proper heat treatment temperature. Um, and then this is, uh, the effect of the calcination temperature on the performance in a, in a pen fuel cell. So this is sort of the benchmark catalyst with the titanium PTL. This is the performance curve, more or less what we saw before. This was a new Herreos catalyst without calcination and it was uh, horrible. Didn't work, right? So you can you shoot up to very high potentials even though you have very low current density. Right? Mm -hmm. So that didn't really work. And the reason was if you look at the impedance that essentially for this catalyst here, for the benchmark catalyst, this semi-circle here is essentially the kinetic, the charge transfer resistance for the oxygen evolution reaction. Uh, so this depends on current density. This circle sits actually here in this uh, non called science new catalyst. And this semi-circle here, which is, has a, a maximum at a pretty high frequency, is essentially a contact resistance, right? So you get the large contact resistance between the catalyst layer and this titanium PCR. Um, if you call sign the catalyst, so this was a 375, then essentially the performance goes to where the benchmark catalyst performance is, what you would expect. Actually, not exactly, but uh, we'll see in a minute. Um, and, and of course, right, this uh, um, conduct, uh, the contact resistance circuit disappears and you're back to the oxygen evolution, right? So this all makes sense. And then what we also saw uh, is uh, so you can improve it essentially by calcination, but what we also saw is we use a non calcine catalyst, which has this poor conductivity, but we use a porous titanium transport layer, which is coated with platinum to give very good contact resistance. Uh, then you get actually also very good performance. Now, of course, uh, you have a very low HFR, so the performance is even, even slightly better. Right? And as a matter of fact, in electrolysis today, the titanium uh, for a transport layer is usually coated with a thin layer of platinum in order to keep uh, a low contact resistance because titanium over time grows a thicker and thicker oxide layer. Um, okay, so, but uh, in principle, the final catalyst was typically a milk by a layer of 375 Celsius. Now, the next question is, and this is actually coming back to this, uh, when we compare the two curves, um, the question is, well, what do we expect in terms of performance? And so in principle, this is the benchmark catalyst at 2.3 milligrams, and this is the new catalyst at 0.3 milligrams. So we have lower loading, and we have lower surface area, right? We put less material, and we have a very low BET, so to speak, so we have less surface area. So you expect that you have less performance, right? And so the question is, how much, what did we expect? So this was a bit of a puzzle that we had a higher performance. And so we went in back and said, okay, what do we expect? And so this here is the performance uh, with a loading of two milligrams per centimeter square with a conventional catalyst, right? And uh, if I calculate the gram reading per kilowatt, so at any, any given point here, I calculate the power density and I take the loading divided by the power density, I get the blue curve, which is shown here, right? And this is the gram reading per kilowatt. And then here, here you can see the numbers in the 300 per centimeter square, we are somewhere around 0 0.4, 0 0.5, right? It's far too high. Um, and then the next question was like, well, what happens if I now reduce the loading from two 
to 0 0.05 milligram per centimeter square using this catalyst, which allows me to still make a finite thickness layer. Um, we say, well, let's assume the oxygen evolution activity is the same as the iridium oxide, because we're just still using iridium oxide in cold climate. Um, in this case, if we use carbon kinetics with 50 millivolts and have no other transport losses, we would expect that the kinetic penalty is the total slope times the log ratio of the loading, because the log ratio of the loading is the log ratio of the available surface area of the catalytic surface, right? And so we would expect we lose 80 millivolts. Losing 80 millivolts in electrolysis means the orange curve would shift up 80 millivolts, right? So this would be our projected performance. So we would have, of course, a worse performance if we go to lower loading. But if you take now this curve and you calculate the gram iridium per kilowatt, then you get the blue curve, the dashed curve here. So of course, the grams iridium per kilowatt gets lower at the cost of efficiency. And now I have two possible operating conditions. I can take point A. So I have a penalty of 80 millivolts at the constant current density, more or less a constant power density. And 80 millivolts corresponds to about, about 6% efficiency, right? You would give up 6% efficiency. Or I take point B, I go over here, my new operating point would be this one. I keep the same efficiency, but of course I would have less current density. Right, and so I can choose of either having a lower efficiency uh, or having a lower power density at the same efficiency, right? And anything in between, of course. But then if I choose one of these points, then you can see at this blue region, right? Uh, this would be my iridium specific power density and that would be below, be below 0 0.01, right? So in principle, it says it's possible. Not changing anything to the catalytic activity of my catalyst, right? Just making sure I can build a layer. Um, however, the problem is we saw actually higher uh, higher performance, right? Because our curve didn't shift upwards, it shifted downwards, right? So this was a bit of a puzzle. Um, and we will solve this in the next section. But in principle, right, if we summarize, if we have a titanium uh, porous transport layer with, titanium, with a titanium oxide layer on the top, we have a high contact resistance between these catalysts, which has iridium hydrosiridium oxide, two options. Either we increase the conductivity of the electrode, meaning we have to cold sign the material to get to a thermal oxide, uh, or we put the platinum coating on the titanium, and then we can still work with a low electrical conductivity electrode, as long as it is thick enough. Right? So these are the two options. Um, and so then we, this catalyst, right, was scaled up by Hereos, and then the question was like, well, we need durability data. What's the point of the beginning of life performance data? But if you do single cell tests, uh, these uh, durability tests can take thousands of hours. So the test here was 4,000 hours. And if I do with single cells, I have to build many, many single cells to get any sort of statistics, right, and to be able to compare it. So this was actually together with uh, HTEC, which is the German uh, electrolysis uh, hardware. Uh, developer Grunerity, who then made the NEA, so the catalyst from areas, and then the uh, Center for Applied Electrochemistry, which is also at the university campus, uh, with whom we collaborated to do short stack tests. And so essentially, uh, these were so called rainbow stacks, where you put MEAs with a benchmark catalyst and MEAs with a new catalyst, and you just alternate them. And then you get the uh, and the average performance of each type of MEA. And these were load cycling tests. So in the 10 units at low, medium, and high current density. And then every week there was a polarization curve conducted where you have proper diagnostics, you measure the high frequency resistance and so on. So this is a short set with about 30 centimeters square of the area. Um, and so these are the data. So this is the benchmark catalyst. So the commercial catalyst is 75% iridium. This is cell voltage. This is the time. Right, and so this is shown at three different current densities, low, medium, high. Um, and what you can see is that at the lowest current density, right, the uh, potential increases over time, meaning the activity decreases, right? So you lose performance, you get the lower efficiency, but then it levels out actually quite well after about a thousand hours or so. And if you go to high current densities, actually, we have the opposite of what we expected, the performance got better. So lower cell voltage required to do electrolysis, uh, which has to do that at this point, sort of the conditioning of the membrane plays a big role and the conductivity changes as it's in the beginning. Right? Uh, if we come, oh, and so the red thing here, this is actually after shutdown. So every time we had a shutdown of the stack, uh, 
which was related to the fact that ice was uh, forming at the outlet of the hydrogen, which they had to get out of the building somehow. Um, so it was in the winter. Uh, then actually, it, it improved a little bit for a while, but then it went back to the sample. So then this is this new catalyst and the loading, which is eight times lower, right? And if you compare the shape of the curves, it's more or less similar, right? You start out with a high activity and then the activity uh, gets worse over the first thousand hours and then it's reasonably close to flat uh, and that the hyper intensity goes down. And uh, if you compare the numbers, right, and you say, well, what's the performance here even after 4,000 hours compared to here, then you can see that this new catalyst has actually more or less the same performance, right? There's maybe 10, 20 millivolts different, even though we expect we should lose 80 millivolts, right? It should be 80 millivolts high. Um, and uh, so initially the equal or higher and at the end uh, it's it's more or less the same and the question is why is this because this is of course completely against our expectation right it's nice if something is better than you expect but if you don't understand it it's also a problem uh, so so you can do this analysis also on the ir free cell voltage so then you take out all these uh, effects from the membrane right and uh, so here is the ir free voltage plotted the different current density and then you can see is for the benchmark catalyst, we are somewhere at around one, minus one, minus three microvolts per hour. So more or less what it means is we cannot really measure the detail of this uh, material in this 4,000 hours, right? You would have to do the test longer, right? But of course, uh, we needed a test station. Uh, and then this is for the new catalyst, right? And here you can see there's a larger decay for this uh, new catalyst, right? So you lose in the beginning. Uh, maybe 60, 70 millivolts versus here you lose only about 30. Uh, and then the slope at the end is still slightly higher, but then of course it depends where exactly you take the data here. But uh, in principle, um, we didn't see anything sort of which uh, would set off a warning light, right? And so the catalyst looks actually quite stable. The only question was like, why do we have so different transients here over time? Um, and uh, the question was, well, is it because the catalyst dissolves? Could be, right? Or, and there's lots of literature which says, well, that hydrazine really mocks that dissolves over time. Or is it the sort of surface reconstruction or reconstruction, crystallite reconstruction of the catalyst, right? And so here's some more detailed analysis. Essentially, what we did is we did a kinetic analysis uh, by using tafel analysis and analyzing the current density. Um, sorry, analyzing at the potential where the current density is very small. So where you definitely can exclude any sort of transport effect. Right? And uh, from that, you can get the mass activity. So here, the mass activity of the catalyst was measured at 1.5 volts. And so this is the mass activity of the benchmark catalyst, sorry, of the benchmark catalyst and of this uh, new catalyst, right? And you have about a factor of 30 times higher activity, right? Uh, then you see over time, sort of this activity decays very strongly here and here is reasonably stable, right? It doesn't change so much, maybe back to one and a half over 4,000 hours. And uh, the reason why it's more active is really, if you go in the literature, hydrogen rhodium oxide is much more active than thermal rhodium oxide, right? However, what the literature also claims is that hydrogen rhodium oxide dissolves very quickly, right? And this, we see no evidence whatsoever. And if you now take the ratio of the OER activity over time, then what you see is in the beginning, it's a factor of 30, right? And then after a time, it actually levels off to a more or less constant value. And this constant value is getting very close to our utilization value, namely the difference in the iridium thickness of the two catalysts, right? Um, and so our, um, yeah, so first about the factor of four, and um, our assumption is really that this is related to a reconstruction of the catalyst over time, that essentially all your hydrogen iridium oxide sooner or later transforms into iridium oxide at high potentials, right? And there's actually some evidence in the literature uh, by, by this group here. Uh, there's, a, you can watch it. They never published it from Tanaka, uh, but there's a leaking abstract in the video online still available. And so what they showed is they started out with hydrogen iridium oxide and after a few thousand hours, they saw, so which was amorphous and after a few thousand hours, they saw crystalline iridium oxide growing, right? And so this is probably, so what we believe is that the catalyst instability in the beginning is really just a reformation from the hydras into iridium oxide, right? And nothing else. 
Okay, and then I think, uh, sorry, but uh, I will skip the microphones later because uh, I'm afraid we already have yeah, quite too much time. So I think, okay, I go to the conclusion. Um, so the, what I showed, I think uh, the platinum requirements are completely negligible in the pen water electrolyzer, right? So absolutely no worry. Uh, if you look at the oxygen evolution test in this, if you use this concept, you can actually do water electrolysis at very low loadings, and the voltage penalty is reasonably small. Um, and uh, with this current uh, catalyst, which one can now buy from Harriot, you can in principle do 25 gigawatts a year. So until the global scale production is beyond 25 gigawatts, we have a few years of time. And so there's, of course, a continuous development of this concept going to slightly larger supports and you can uh, make lower loadings. Uh, this is what I didn't show you. Uh, so microporous layers, right? So this is your porous transport layer. This is thickness of about 20 to 50 micron holes. Uh, you can put on a microporous layer with holes of about a micron. And it plays a big role when you have spin membranes, right? If you have thin membranes, the membrane can penetrate over time into these large cavities. So if I have 20 micron cavities in the 50 micron membrane, that's a problem. But if the cavities are one micron or two microns, then it doesn't play a big role. Um, and with this, uh, these are the people who mostly worked on it. So this was the first student who started with this work, and then these three guys uh, came later. And then this is uh, a colleague uh, from this institute where we did the trust test. tests. Uh, these are the people in the companies which with whom we worked in which over the six years or so, uh, from Hereos, Greenerity, Omex, MEA, the Mage Tech Connect Electrolyzers. This is the funding, of course, it was paid. Uh, and then this is the rest of the group. And then I thank you for your attention and I apologize that I was long. Five minutes over again. <laughs> Uh, yeah, very, really nice talk. Uh, I was curious, how do you make the uh, low iridium loading catalyst? Is it through ALD or? No, it's actually, no, it's quite simple. I mean, you essentially, you suspend the uh, titanium powder in a aqueous solution. Uh, and then you add the iridium chloride salt. And then you change the pH and then you get the deposition. So it's on uh, just some liquid liquid deposition, 60-70 degrees or something like this. And so, of course, I mean, yeah, I mean, Hedeos didn't tell us all the tricks at the end, get the perfect homogeneous, but in principle, this is more or less like the approach. So it's a lot of construction right now that produce a catalyst. And uh, when I looked at this, I was uh, puzzled because I always thought that if you have something where you have, um, I don't know, 10 grams of catalyst in a liter of your reactor, it's possibly not so useful, right? But essentially, they have a three cubic meter reactor, and then they have 10 kilos of catalyst, and uh, that's enough for a couple of gigawatts. So it takes them three days, so they make it by batch, but I guess for no metal catalyst, that's possible. What, what size are the titanium dioxide particles here? So on the left, it's about 30, 40 nanometers. So okay. the little spheres, I mean, the agglomerates are longer, right? Yeah. So the sphere is about 30 nanometers here, okay. and this whole agglomerate size is maybe a few hundred nanometers. And in this case, the sphere is uh, approximately 10 times larger, so 150 to 300 nanometers. Well, it's much safer, safer. Yeah. Exactly, because you want to minimize the surface area so that you don't need so much iridium. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. In the coil industry, they use the thinning box side mm -hmm. on titanium. Yeah. And they uh, and they often mix the titanium chloride with a, uh, a, a titanium containing solution, mm -hmm. some sort of titanium molecules. And they basically get a titanium titanium oxide. And they fire at 400 degrees and they get a detailed structure. That's, that's what they get. Yeah. But the way of diluting also is 
something similar happening here too. Mm, yes, so you can you can make uh, so we made this type of catalyst where we had a mixed solid solution of the tannium oxide and the xenium oxide. We actually had quite a wide range of intermissibility. Um, so you can do 50 50, 50 so to speak. Um, you dilute the activity, of course, but the problem is we don't enhance the stability. So it's like 50 to 100 hours in the cinema slot in the electrolyzer. And so I don't know why it is so much more steady in the in the alkaline, but there, of course, we're only sitting at about 1.5 volts. Okay, so I'm asking, can you do the same thing with uh, the iridium that you use in the thing? So you say the dilution of the iridium is 50 50 with titanium oxide. We also tried. So the phase, the phase diagram of the iridium oxide, titanium oxide is such that you can dissolve. 10% of titanium oxide in iridium oxide or 10% iridium oxide in titanium oxide. And so we made actually a material where we had 10% titanium oxide in iridium oxide. And uh, we dilute the activity a little bit. Um, but it, it has, a, for in the electrolysis, has no effect. It has a big effect when you look at the reduction stability of the iridium oxide. So you cannot reduce it anymore or not very easily. Uh, if you dilute titanium into it, but uh, here it might not be so. So per gram of iridium, the activity didn't change. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Uh, 